starts. This is uh, March 31st, 2016. Uh, Zoom web and R uh, for the EDLS 702 L2. Z group and 702LZ group. We are meeting class this weekend, uh, April 2nd and April 3rd. We will be at Stuart Kramer High School on Saturday, April the 2nd. That address is 101 Lakewood Road, Belmont, North Carolina. Class, I have emailed that uh, information to you several times, including the address. I hope that you are well aware of that. I have heard from some of you. I had asked that you uh, confirm that you do know that class is on site at Kramer High School on Saturday. If you've not done that, I hope that you'll do that if you happen to get this link and listen before Saturday. If not, I'll be calling those I've not heard from tomorrow sometime to make sure you know where to be Saturday. Of course, Sunday we'll be back on campus at Gardner Webb in Boiling Springs on Sunday, April 3rd. Both days were starting at 9 o'clock. This will be our third face-to-face -face weekend coming up. We still have a number of uh, uh, topics to go over. We will not finish all those topics this weekend, so we will be doing some more Zooms the following Thursday nights to try to finish up. Uh, we have a little more work to do with facilities on Saturday. Of course, we're meeting at Stuart Kramer High School because that uh, is an extremely fine example of a new constructed high school. And we're grateful to uh, Jeff Booker, superintendent in Gaston County and a part of our class who arranged that for us. And then we will look at uh, safety as it applies to the structure itself. And we'll look at school safety in terms of uh, behavior of teachers and students, uh, the insides of buildings, mold, mildew, air quality, playground equipment, uh, failure of equipment, et cetera, that could cause safety issues for students. And then we'll talk a little bit about the way buildings are built uh, with regard to the behavior of humans that might come and try to harm our students. As you all know, uh, since Sandy Hook and before that, Columbine, et cetera, uh, the unthinkable uh, is now things that we have to deal with somewhat on a regular basis, which is very sad uh, for all of us. But we'll look at that construction in terms of that, that focus as well. And we'll look at current buildings Talk about your safety plans. We still have the broad area of custodial and maintenance employees to look at. We'll do that some on Saturday. And then on Sunday, we'll focus on buses uh, and tr school transportation, both uh, yellow, the yellow buses and activity buses and other school vehicles. And then we'll look at school food service uh, issues. We Again, we won't finish all that this weekend, but that's those are the broad areas we'll, we'll look at, and then we'll zoom out what we can before the semester ends. All of you know we're loading Blackboard each week on Sunday night with a number of artifacts and documents that we hope you're uh, finding time to at least review and look over as a way of uh, building your information and knowledge regarding this uh, module of uh, organizational management. What I want to do tonight is just break briefly take you through this uh, planning text that you have, the Earthman text. It looks like this. I'm not going to pull up documents like I normally do. I'm simply going to take this text and walk through it as quickly as I can in terms of the important parts I've highlighted uh, to try to save us some time this weekend. We will start with facilities on Saturday actually continue because as you recall last time we met we had architect Tom Balky in and we talked about a number of issues with him and his presentation and then Jeff uh, presented some great uh, PowerPoint information about some of the school construction he's been involved in. The Earthman text is a, is a pretty good book. Uh, the author spent over 40 years in, in uh, this area of work considers that to be his expertise. So he's done, a, I think, a good job of giving you a very good overview of the chief components that we need to keep in mind when we plan school facilities. So it's 
not going to be the most glamorous discussion, but I'm going to walk quickly through the highlights of, of this text, and we'll spend about 45 minutes or so to an hour tonight. What I don't finish tonight, we'll either do Saturday or in, in another Zoom. Chapter one of this book begins to talk about organization and policy planning. In larger schools, specialization can take place where you have somewhat of experts that take care of a lot of this. In smaller districts, that's not the case. So quite often you'll see that kind of work hired out. Planning school building is one of the most important tasks that a school district will be involved in, especially larger districts who are building uh, more often than the smaller or medium sized districts. But even for a small district, uh, planning a new school is among the most important and critical tasks that one could do. Uh, across this country, there's about 15,000 different school districts. Your text tells you that about 80% of the student population uh, attends a larger uh, district and the remaining 20% of the student population would, would attend one of those 14,000 remaining school districts. So there's a lot of small and medium sized districts that uh, would need to draw on the expertise of outside sources like architects and other experts. Um, depending on your size of district, you'll have uh, certain organizational charts that would, would demonstrate uh, the capacity for building different schools. So uh, obviously the Gaston County School District that Jeff is the superintendent of would build many more schools than say the district that I was in, Newton Conover City. Um, the book begins to talk about school board policies, and we mentioned that briefly in our classes already. You know that our work is, is governed and guided by uh, efficient and strong policies. Earthman begins to talk about policies that would be related to school facilities, and he mentions a number of those on page seven and eight. Policies regarding the following selection of the site school name selection, site size, school size and capacity, design submissions, uh, school feeder patterns, monitoring the design process, it's where school boundaries are, how to award contracts, costing of the capital project, the bidding process we talked a little about, evaluation of your existing buildings, and that's one of the tasks I've asked you to do is to go in and look at one of your current facilities and do an assessment of that. So your board would more likely than not have a policy on the way that type of assessment would take place. Uh, you also have had uh, to develop educational specifications, ed specs. There are typically, especially in larger districts, policies that would govern how that takes place. So, so on and so forth. So I would encourage you to, to check out the long list on page seven and eight in terms of types of policies that your district uh, should likely have or need to develop, especially again, if you're building schools more than every 20 or 30 years. We talked at length already about the importance of planning. And we've said often that if you, uh, if you uh, fail to plan, then you basically plan to fail. So Earthman uh, picks up this baton and again talks about the importance of planning. Uh, he breaks that down, of course, into short-term goals and the, into long-term goals. He also mentions the fact that uh, given the nature of school boards, that sometimes that planning is directed uh, in a personal manner in terms of uh, a certain bend or desire that an individual board member or community member might have. And so you have to guard against that. Uh, even so, if you do a good job planning, typically your organization moves forward and uh, is able to accomplish a, an amount of work. So bottom line, the basic uh, uh, reason that we do organizational planning is to develop uh, acceptable goals, to allocate our resources effectively and to, to marshal and conserve staff cooperation and input into the goal efforts. Berthman talks about the planning, a couple of different planning models. One he calls a rational planning model, a very linear, uh, detailed, fact-oriented type of planning that is, that is done and should be done. And then he talks about interactive planning. 
interactive planning implies uh, by the very word that you involve more stakeholders and that's typically the kind of leadership management we experience these days is that we try to pull people in create teams of of uh, stakeholders uh, give them buy-in and a say so in the process um, the best models of planning however incorporate the rational planning with the interactive planning so we've said often you need facts and figures you can't just go on instinct or how a person might feel about a certain uh, topic or issue you need to have your uh, discovery and your facts in line um, Earthman makes the strong point that the superintendent has got to be very involved in the planning process and in fact many times superintendents are hired because they have expertise in planning or because they have a certain vision for the school district so I would encourage all of you who aspire to the superintendency to, to uh, take great uh, pain in learning about the construction facility process because your people will look to you as a leader in that area and expect you to have a vision and expect you to know how important these planning processes really are. Earthman does a good job of summarizing uh, planning steps on page 15 and 16. And these are uh, pretty uh, common and global in nature. Anytime you uh, begin to plan, you identify and agree on the problem or the goal that you want to achieve or solve. Then there's an identification of the data, the information that you need. What do we need to know in order to get this accomplished? Following your discovery of, of facts, it's very similar to the scientific process. You formulate uh, optional alternative solutions. We have solution A, solution B, solution C, et cetera. So you determine that there is a goal you want to meet or a problem. You look at the data that, that tells you and informs you, and then you decide here are our possible options for solution uh, or possible solutions. And fourthly, you identify the one that you prefer to go with in terms of solution. Five is the actual implementation of a plan. And then six, once it's implemented and carried out, then an obvious result is to, or an obvious next step rather, is to evaluate the process and the outcome and see how things went. It's, it's a constant feedback loop that you're uh, involving yourself in. Um, we talked at length about strategic planning, so I won't do a big stop off here, but uh, strategic planning typically takes, uh, is over a longer period of time, typically three to five years, involves a lot more people, and uh, creates change over time, and, and much less of an emergency type situation it's typically complex it's typically uh, involving a lot of people uh, it's best done of course when you have a, a time frame of several years not just one year or so uh, schools are somewhat guilty I would suppose of sometimes knee-jerk type reactions the best systems will will do their due diligence and do a good job planning uh, over a longer period of time so that they're not caught off guard, especially in the area of school facilities. So, uh, Earthman says the key on page 20, the key for educators is to link the strategic planning activities to the more traditional planning efforts, such as the operational plan and budget and the long range plan of the school district and the instructional planning that, that might span over several years. So, so bottom line, you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot replace good planning. And if you don't do good planning, even in terms of facilities, which is sometimes harder to do because you're looking at uh, some unknowns at times regarding population, et cetera. But if you fail to do that, then you're really going to come up short as time passes and you will look like uh, nobody was minding the store. So planning for new buildings, chapter three, is an important function. It's, it's typically a number of different steps. Uh, he talks about uh, the, the following steps on page 22 uh, as a separate process and taken together as a whole uh, creates the plan. 
You organize your staff, determine the size of the student populations you're dealing with. We will talk more about how you do that. You develop your ed specs. You know, what, what will this new facility, uh, who, will, who will it serve? How many will it serve? What subjects will be taught there? What uh, focus areas do we have in terms of vocational ed, for example, the media center? Uh, will it have one gym, two gyms? Will it focus on science? What's the technology like, et cetera, so forth? So you develop uh, clearly your set of educational specifications. Site acquisition, finding the right site is an important part of the step. Finding and selecting an architect, developing a funding package, how are we going to pay for it? In North Carolina, that's typically done through your, in conjunction with your county commissioners. It's typically through a bond package. Very few school districts will have the money to pay as you go as, as one option, for example. Once you get a funding package, begin construction, then you would monitor the design phase of the building. You'd advertise the project, get your bids in, employ a contractor. The building begins to be constructed, so you would monitor the construction process. You finalize and get your building built. You orient your staff, train your people, uh, welcome your community in, and then evaluate how the building process went. So those are some quick steps he gives on page 22. He visits those in a larger way later in the book. Responsibility for planning falls on the superintendent first, and then the wise person uh, superintendent will involve key people in that process. It, it needs to be a cooperative affair. It needs to involve your board of uh, commissioners, your, your board of education. Uh, it needs to be a very purposeful activity as you engage these people. Um, he begins to talk about uh, long range plan as a document on page 24 and he, he says the following topics are extremely important. Uh, you have a section describing your community, what it's like, what the resources are like, what outside uh, programs are there, what the people are like, what the needs of the community are in terms of economics and uh, services. You look at the educational programs that you want to have, the number of programs, the location of programs. Very clearly, you look at student projections, what kind of kids, how many kids, what the grade levels uh, look like. You look at your total amount of school facilities, how many teaching spaces that you need. You look at your financial plan. So these are common headings that would be in a long-range uh, planning document. Then Earthman talks about each of those groups at large, the community, the educational program, the student projections, the facilities, the financial plan. And then he gets into a discussion of action plans. Action plan is actually how you're going to carry out this long range plan. Uh, so it gives you a chart on page 27 uh, that illustrates those long, plan, long range plan sections and then the, the individual plans that will come out of that, such as the curriculum plan, the instructional plan, human resources, personnel type plans, capital improvement of your current your buildings, your budget plans, your operating budgets year to year, et cetera. All those tie together. So a wise planner is, is juggling a, a number of uh, tennis balls at one time and keeps all those things in mind. Um, he also talks about several segments of the of the office, uh, the district office. And they have to focus on the following, the job that is to be completed, the objectives of the job, the measure of effectiveness, the costs associated with attaining those objectives, deadlines for completion, and then I would add a sixth item there myself, and you need to decide who is responsible for each of those tasks. So. Chapters one, two, and three talk at length about the planning process. And then he goes into chapter four about the educational program development. Uh, that's more related to your 700 course in terms of curriculum, but you do need to make sure that you put plenty of time in thinking about your uh, educational curriculum programs because your building needs to support and uh, service those programs. That's the whole reason you're building the facility that you're building. 
is to house those programs. Um, communities are unique, and he makes the point that as you think about your planning process, that you know your community very well. For example, there may be certain services that are provided in the community, certain parks that you have already, certain museums, art galleries, et cetera. A wise school district has a very clear understanding of all those resources so that you can complement your educational program by the use of those related programs. Um, long range plans uh, should include a description of that so that you are uh, working smarter and not always harder. Uh, he makes the point here that the more complex an organization is, uh, the less likely it is that all the employees will know your goals and ideals and values. So it's important to have that kind of thing in writing and, and be very explicit in terms of explaining that to your uh, uh, employees. They are your best uh, advertisement on the ground in terms of letting the community know what's going on. So he begins to talk about vision statements, mission statements, uh, philosophy of education statements, <coughs> goals and objectives. And I would uh, hasten to add that you need a, a strong discussion of what are the values of your district that, that govern and guide your work. The values are very important. Chapter four, uh, he continues to talk about uh, taking goals and, and uh, stating those as a behavioral objectives. The notion behind that is if, if you cannot measure an objective as to whether or not you accomplish it, then it's not a well-stated uh, objective. So behind every goal is a number of strategies that help you accomplish that goal. And I know all of you know uh, those kind of things already in your current work. Berthman talks about needs assessment on page 41. I would uh, go back and relate to the uh, facility assessment that you're, that you're doing or that you have done in the past. Uh, it's important to know what the current conditions of your facilities are, what the needs of the school district are in terms of, of uh, building, uh, maintenance, repairs, et cetera. So uh, you, you need to be in a constant uh, motion of doing needs assessment uh, annually if possible, but certainly every couple of years in terms of your facilities. Chapter five, Earthman talks about uh, long range planning related to student enrollment projections. Now that's a uh, pretty common sense. You've got to know how many students that you're dealing with. And he goes over a, a number of uh, reasons for those uh, projections. He talks about the need to address the four F's of administration, which he refers to as funding, faculty, facilities, and function. And so our main focus for this discussion and I has to do with the funding and the facilities, but you have to know all four of those in order to do a good job with any of them. They, uh, they stand alone, but they also stand together in terms of, of the information needed. Um, keep in mind this too, it takes anywhere from two to five years from concept to completion for a school building to be built. Once you begin to talk about it, focus on the need, gather uh, public support, employ an architect, architect uh, do the design phase of the building, start the construction, get it built. It takes for high school at least five years, elementary school and middle school three to four years. So uh, this is not something you do quickly. Therefore, the long range planning that we talked about is extremely important. And the use of all this data is extremely important. Uh, when you think about population projections, you look at the economic conditions in the area. You look for telltale signs, of course, if you have businesses coming to the area, there's a pretty good indication new people are moving in, populated, population is growing. If you begin to see businesses close, uh, especially industry, that's, that's a clear sign that most likely populations will be decreasing. Quite obviously, you don't want to be building uh, schools if you're not 
certain that you're going to have the population uh, to sustain that growth. Uh, you certainly don't want to build a school and you have it at half capacity, for example. Um, so the name of the game is planning and very good planning. There's a number of uh, indices, indicators, indexes that you use to try to look at uh, population projections. He mentions housing starts and completions. He mentions telephone and sewer connections, postal receipts, immigration rates, employment rates, certain economic factors. There's a long list of things on page 46, social conditions in the community. Fertility rates makes the uh, some point in here of the uh, comical uh, uh, revelation that uh, certain communities when they have electric failures during the winter surprisingly nine months later you have an increase in birth rate so all those things begin to matter uh, even to the point of a military installation for example like we have here in north carolina those kind of things uh, will dictate the number of student population that we have Earthman mentioned census, and we've looked at Western Piedmont Council of Government uh, studies in our classes already in terms of uh, determining population. Uh, all of you understand the federal government does population studies at least every decade, every 10 years. Um, local government typically keeps up with that as well and does more often uh, population studies that give you projections of, of students. So there are different projection methods. Uh, he, he goes over uh, some basic uh, methodologies on page 51. You can forecast school, uh, school enrollment from your total population. You can forecast by analysis of past uh, population. You can forecast by different mathematical techniques. You can use what is called the Bell Telephone Company method, which the rate of the increase in total population is applied to the increase in student population. He mentions a guy named McConnell in 57, uh, expanded these methods in, in, uh, into nine different uh, types of methods. A couple others that he in, uh, included were the multiple factor method, the law of growth called the Pearl Reed Logistic Curve and projecting natural increase. Um, the mathematical concepts that are used, multiple regression is often used. Uh, retention or population survival is often uh, mentioned. The bottom line and the main point is that you need some basis understanding of, of what your student populations are going to do so that you can wisely forecast uh, how many children are going to be are going to be in your schools? A very common uh, process that you've probably heard of is the cohort survival ratios. In terms of uh, a group of students moving through your school, first grade to second grade to third grade, etc. Uh, cohort survival it looks at the, the, the percentage of those students who stay with you. So that's an important factor that you need to keep in mind. Um, they also use a, another uh, ratio called the linear survival ratio. This is on page 57. It's a little different from the cohort survival. Linear looks at a grade level, not the same group of students that are moving through, but it compares the number of kids in first grade this year with the number of kids in first grade next year. So it's a different student population. What they're looking at is how many students are in that grade level year after year. So that's that's called the linear survival ratio. So both of those are used sometimes to uh, compute the student enrollment uh, projections. And of course, there are different software programs that, that can be used. And uh, you have you have good city planners typically that you can access statisticians, actuaries that can help you do that. So a word to the wise, while we're not uh, responsible to be able to do those computations, we are responsible to know the people who can do those and help us forecast and plan for those student populations. <clears throat> 
So that's chapter uh, five. I won't spend any more time there, but have some idea of, of how populations are determined and know the importance of student enrollment projections in the planning process. Uh, it is, is absolutely essential that you know how many students to plan for. And it does not have to be a complete guessing game. Chapter six, uh, moving right along, it's extremely important as you think about new construction that you look at existing buildings, existing facilities. And uh, the topic of this chapter is the evaluation of existing facilities. And again, you have looked at uh, a facility assessment already. And if you go on line and Google this notion of assessing current facilities, there's a number of tools that are available that helps you look at uh, facilities in, in many different ways. I want to look at his list on page 70 regarding the purpose of, of evaluating existing buildings. These are rather common sense, but they're very important. One is to determine which existing facilities will be able to accommodate the desired programs that you have with a certain number of students. To determine the improvements that are needed. Thirdly is to develop a list of building improvements and maintenance items that you would include in your capital, your annual capital plan. Fourth is to provide data on which to base subsequent designs of new buildings. You have to know what you have now in order to determine what you need in the future. Uh, to determine, fifthly, to determine to what extent each facility aids you in certain functions like desegregation or reaction to certain population shifts, a sudden economic turndown, for example, declines in population, aging of the community, et cetera. So, Knowing what your current facilities look like is important in that regard. And then last, he mentions to verify the current existing teaching stations, spaces or uh, stations uh, so that you can know how you equip your teaching staff. So in order to evaluate facilities, he encourages the development of what he calls evaluation teams. Typically, that would involve your maintenance director, the site principal, usually at least one person from the central office. So he begins to talk about what those teams might look like. Your district uh, perhaps would define that in their own manner, but, but there would be some commonality across most all districts. You need to decide for your district how often you're going to evaluate facilities. Uh, my suggestion would be uh, your maintenance director is on top of that doing something annually, but about every three years, I think it would be wise to bring in additional support <coughs> facility people that do this all the time that can help walk the buildings with your maintenance people and uh, really do an extremely thorough job about every three years. So when you evaluate the building, uh, Earthman talks on page 71 about the systems that you're looking at, such as the HVAC, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, your lighting, your plumbing, uh, your technology, of course you look at the condition of your roofs, your floors, the paint, all those, all those areas you examine and begin to list. I, I hope you uh, got this. I sent you a document that Jeff Booker had sent to me, the Charlotte Mecklenburg's plan for facilities. Uh, they just assessed all their facilities, which is a huge task looking at new construction, but also at prioritizing uh, annual capital maintenance as well. They, they did a superb job. It's a great example. And we'll take a little time in class Saturday to look at that. But they assess their buildings extremely well. And then the second key part is they, they, um, they evaluate in terms of uh, the priority for those improvements. Obviously, you don't have enough money to do everything you need to do. So you, more often than not, perhaps always, you would prioritize and begin to work down your list of things that need to be done. Uh, I know that when I went to my school district, uh, uh, my first six months, one thing I did was bring in a former maintenance director and had and paid him to work with the current maintenance director. 
and we evaluated all of our buildings from top to bottom and, and uh, made sure that we knew where our greatest needs were. So extremely important as you think about new construction, you've got to know what your old construction looks like. Along with the actual condition of the building, you're looking also at simple maintenance and trying to determine a timeline for things that might need extra attention. Uh, it's very, very wise to know, uh, for example, that there's a preventive maintenance schedule in place. If you don't have somebody that's meticulous with that, that are changing air filters, that are oiling certain motors, uh, taking care of drive belts that may be cracked, uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, looking for leaks in plumbing, etc. If you don't have somebody doing a great job with PEM preventive maintenance, you're gonna you're gonna pay a lot more money down the road. So, evaluation of the maintenance needs is extremely important too. I've already mentioned Earthman does as well on page 72. The appraisal instruments, there's a number of those out. My, my encouragement to you as a district is to make sure you have a good one that you use to uh, evaluate your buildings with. He mentioned several here. Uh, they seem a little bit outdated to me, page 72 and 73, but the bottom line is to make sure your district has a good assessment tool that you use to evaluate your building. Most state departments, North Carolina included, will have uh, various documents that can help you with that. Their uh, division of planning typically will have a good document. Uh, I would search high and low and find one that really does a good job and make that a part of your annual practices. The um, periodic evaluation of the building should include an appraisal in the following areas. This is on page 74. These are things, broad things you're looking for, the ability to support the educational program, the adaptability of the building, the aesthetic quality of the building. Is it clean? Is it pretty? Is it well kept? Uh, is it a fun looking place to be in? Is it smack of, of love for children, etc.? Is there a structural soundness? Are there any structural issues? What are the current site conditions? including the building inside and out. How efficient is the building operationally and, and maintenance wise, the condition of mechanical systems we've mentioned already. And safety, compliance with safety rules. Is it ADA compliant? Uh, how many doors does it have to the outside? Is it easy to maintain in terms of uh, monitoring and supervision? All those kinds of things. So only through a really uh, intentional uh, process of inspecting your facilities, assessing your facilities, can you be on top of your game? And so I would encourage you along with Earthman in your district, make certain that you know what your process is, how often do we look at the, the whole picture, where do we keep those records, and how deliberate are we in, in making those improvements as we get finances to do that. Speaking of finance, in chapter seven, he begins to talk about financial planning. Uh, we talked a lot about that in our first weekend in terms of the finances. You know that you have your, typically your commissioners will give you money for annual capital, which, which uh, takes care of uh, smaller uh, needs in terms of some minor construction, takes care of your building uh, maintenance, your cleaning, custodial services, those kinds of things. And then you have financial planning for your long-term capital needs, typically would involve new construction, bond programs, et cetera, so forth. <clears throat> Earthman talks a little bit about federal funding. We've already mentioned uh, QSAB money in past uh, discussions. Uh, that's basically interest-free money that you can get qualified school construction bond money. Uh, that window is probably passed now unless it's opened back up. He mentioned several key uh, pieces of legislation that you're all familiar with, the Northwest Ordinance of 1797, where the 16th and 32nd townships were given as government land for local purposes of schools uh, and, and uh, in some cases churches. He talks about the education for all handicapped students since 1976 and the Section 504, the Rehabilitation Act. The point is federal government 
has a limited amount of involvement, but there are there are plenty of situations over the past hundred years or so, a couple hundred in some cases, where the federal government has given us a huge head start on some key issues. Uh, the state does very, very little with uh, construction. Typically, they are more operations and uh, personnel funding for us. And then, of course, the lo local commissioners, local uh, counties are typically asked to uh, pay for construction of new buildings. He mentions grant and aid, which is uh, not real pronounced, so it's not a major player. And then spends time, of course, about the local government funding. Pay as you go may have been a concept that worked a hundred years ago. It certainly does not work now. You would find it very hard to uh, come up with a savings account to uh, support a new school. Elementary school is anywhere from 11 to 15 million now. A high school anywhere from 60 to 80 to 90 million. Those kinds of big sums of money are typically uh, acquired through your bond programs, a general obligation bond program that he talks about on page 87. I know that uh, there are different types of bonds and he begins to talk about those term bonds. They're issued for a predetermined amount of time. Sinking fund bonds, serial bonds, uh, they're redeemed at different different times for example a part part of the bonds would be redeemed at the five-year mark others would be redeemed at the 10-year mark 15-year mark typically bonds will run about a 20-year cycle and you're bidding those out for the lowest type of interest that you can get uh, and you always have a bond attorney that helps you with that process your credit rating he talks about page uh, 90 it's important for your district, uh, more likely your county, to have a good bond rating so that you can get the, the cheapest interest rates on your bonds. So, uh, and typically, you already know this, when you uh, go through the bond process, you would typically do an election uh, and ask the general public to support a bond passage and then uh, pending that successful election, uh, approval through a, a yes no election, then you would be able to borrow that money. Um, there are some other options beyond new school construction he talks about. You can convert existing buildings, whether they're uh, government buildings or even business buildings in your uh, area. Sometimes they can be converted to make good school facilities. He uh, mentions in one area an ex inexpensive type building that he uh, says is, is uh, supported is a large balloon built on the concept of air pressure. I've never personally heard of that. Uh, I, I wouldn't think that parents would want their kids going to school in a large balloon structure, but he brings that up. Perhaps that's in some large urban districts. There are there there are not. Often, this is not often done, but there are situations where community facilities might be used uh, in a partnership with schools, municipal buildings, libraries, museums, et cetera, especially in a situation, for example, if you had a school building suddenly burned down, it is not uh, that um, foreign to think that a school would uh, use a library, a public library, if it were a large facility or a combination of those facilities, if you had a sudden urgent need like a school fire. Obviously, the best uh, scenario is that you're, you're able to plan ahead and build the structure that you need and take care of the needs that way. Chapter 8, moving right along. We'll go about 10 more minutes and, and uh, then we'll finish up in another Zoom. But he talks about the development of the capital improvement program in chapter eight. Uh, it's important that that planning come back in place that we talked about already. Uh, having the budget to support that capital improvement plan. If you don't have the money, then you can't accomplish the task. Um, he, he mentions that uh, 
the per persons responsible for capital improvements uh, vary from place to place. Sometimes it's a state level responsibility. More often than not, however, it's a local government responsibility, like the county commissioners. And um, then he talks about preventive maintenance that we've already already discussed. So chapter uh, chapter nine, uh, he discusses educational specifications. Uh, there are several different instruments that, that you can use. All this is talking about is determining the programs that are going to be offered inside that building and having the right facilities to support those programs. He highly cautions against having the architect be the author of that educational specification plan, but he quickly says that quite often in smaller districts, the architect ends up writing that educational spec, and he would say that it's an important process that you need to involve teachers in, principals in, so that uh, so the architect is an architect. He's not an instructional leader. He's not a teacher, typically. So while he has experiences with many different settings, many different school districts, for example, uh, he's used to building school buildings, he still lacks the expertise that those teaching in the trenches would have. So. The development of these ed specs is extremely important and a number of questions that need to be asked. He gives a great list on page 109, again, common sense kinds of things, but some of those would include the following. How many students are you serving? What are their age groups? What are their needs? Are there special needs kids, for example? Is this a certain type of magnet school? Is it an arts magnet school? Is it a technology magnet school? Is it specialized on a foreign language, for example? <clears throat> so what subjects will be taught? What are the methods of teaching? You know, back in the early 70s, we had the open classroom concept. So you need to be very aware of the methods of teaching. What's the technology like? There's a huge driver these days in school, const school construction. Types of areas, instructional areas, uh, separate meeting rooms, for example. Uh, what kind of teacher work areas will you need? Uh, how long will the school day be? Will, it, will the building be used for multiple purposes? How many students will eat lunch when? How? I mean, how many different cycles? Will you offer drama, music, sports? What are your athletic needs? Uh, will your community use the building? Uh, what, what will your media center need to look like? And, uh, what type of content subject will you provide science, math, English, vocational, etc. So all this kind of stuff has to be decided obviously ahead of time in an educational specifications document. He talks at length about the development process of that document. He mentions school board approval is extremely important. And then on page 12, he gives a long laundry list of the content of the ed specification document. And some of these things, a lot of these we've not talked about already, you need to clearly describe the following. Educational situation and student body. Who, who are you serving? What are they like? Description of the community. What's your community like? The site that you're building on and the development of the site. What, what's it going to take? You're going to have to backfill with 35 feet of dirt. You're going to remove X number of tons of dirt. Is it on bedrock? Will it have to have extra reinforcement? What's the, the soil sample like? What's the erosion? All those kinds of things. Uh, what type of programs we've mentioned already need to be offered? What are the educational trends you're looking at? Your technology? Uh, indoor and outdoor recreational facilities, will there be partnerships that you provide with the community? We've not mentioned this yet, but furniture and equipment, what are the needs there? All these things need to be talked about in the Ed Spec document. The uh, parking and vehicle traffic, what's that going to be like? Security, safety kinds of issues, you need to address that. And then community use of the facility. There are a num number of things, and I'm sure you could add to the list, but uh, when you think about the Ed Specs are really the driver for how that 
architects team is going to design that building. You got to have the specs, then you get into the design phase of the building. Chapter 10, and I'll close with this, but he talks about site selection and acquisition. Obviously, it's extremely important that you select the best site for the building, and we've talked in class already that you don't often always have a lot of flexibility here. Sometimes you use land you already have. Uh, in urban districts, it's quite different. One, you can't afford to buy acreage like you would in a rural urban area. One, you can't afford it. Two, it's not available if you could afford it. So you begin to think about space, size, price is extremely important. He advocates that you look at a process called land, a land bank, especially larger districts where you have a whole department that's devoted to going out and acquiring land over uh, a period of time so that you always have available space to build your schools on. Uh, he gets gets into this uh, issue of uh, if sites are difficult to acquire, then you look at alternate uh, processes like using existing buildings. But for our discussion here, obviously the 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 sooner you go out and typically buy property, the the better price you will get on property. He mentions. Uh, there, there are several different ways to acquire property. One is you purchase from the owner. This is on page 119. You could receive a gift from a donor. That's a really sweet way to acquire land. He spends some time talking about this issue of eminent domain, which means the right to take a citizen's property given the common good for the people. So you could exercise the right of eminent domain as you might expect, that's very uh, political. When you tell somebody we're taking your land, even if it's for a noble purpose like building a school, all of us, I think, would have some uh, problem with somebody telling us that we, we need your land. Now, obviously, there are safeguards in place in, in terms of the fair market value that you're given, et cetera, so forth. But it becomes very personal, for example, if your, your family has owned a farm for 150 years and suddenly this notion of eminent domain comes up and somebody is going to give you a market price, but you must sell. And then the fourth uh, manner of site acquisition he mentions is the receipt of surplus governmental property. There are times when the government will give a piece of property. The, the downside is this. Typically it's not uh, good land, typically it's not in a good location, so that's not always the best uh, method. Most frequently, you're going to go out and acquire land through uh, a purchase from an owner. You have to guard against somebody trying to take advantage of your situation by overpricing the property, uh, but a wise district will, will, especially a larger district, will continue to have somebody that's watching property uh, watching the real estate market, uh, if they happen to see a large uh, parcel of acreage uh, that could be acquired, they will uh, act on that as, as much as possible. Earthman talks about school site standards uh, in terms of the size needed. Again, urban districts would be different, and each state is different. If you look at North Carolina and you have a planning document, on our blackboard that, that talks about these specifications, uh, how many acres are recommended for an elementary, middle, or high school. So he gives some parameters there. For elementary, one acre, uh, 10 acres as a beginning point, plus one acre for every 100 students. All the way up to a high school, a typical size will be 30 acres plus another acre for each 100 students. So uh, they give you some ballpark uh, parameters in terms of finding the size of acreage that you might need. We will talk at more at length about all of this, but when you're thinking about land acquisition, you need to look at things like traffic in the area. You need to look at services provided in terms of utilities, phone, natural gas, water and sewer, etc. so forth. Um, number of people that you have to involve, and we'll talk at length more about that as we get into class. Um, 
some of the site selection criteria that he mentions on 125 and 126. Proximity to the center of student population, adequate size and shape of the, of the land, accessibility to the site, uh, existing traffic hazards, or if it's near an industrial area, for example, probably not a good idea. Again, utility services that we've mentioned, suitability of the soil. We alluded to that, but if you have soil that, that is uh, not compacted, for example, adequately, or if you have uh, soil that's too impervious or not impervious enough, or heaven forbid, but there's some hazardous waste that was dumped on it years ago, all those kinds of things have to be considered. The pricing of the property is important. The uh, elevation and the contour of the land in terms of, of drainage, you don't want to site a school, for example, in a low area that's prone to flooding or moisture that would draw mosquitoes, et cetera. Um, the environment around the school, whether it's conducive for students or not, uh, aesthetic appeal, is, is it a nice site? Does it look nice? Does it appeal to parents and community? terms of where you would want your children to be. How about zoning? What were the zoning regulations like? Is it suitable for construction? In terms of the type of building you want to build. Uh, parking spaces, athletic field spaces, uh, any geographical or topical type features that would create uh, huge construction uh, challenges. So on and so forth. So there's a million things you have to think about in terms of finding the right site. And you don't always have a lot of flexibility, but as much as possible, you need to keep all these types of things in mind. So I'm going to close with that. We've gone about an hour and I uh, know you're tired, but bottom line here, we, we've looked at the highlights of chapters one through 10, a little bit more to do in 10. Earthman's text is a good broad overview of this issue of planning for good facilities and I hope that you've read it. I encourage you to read it if you haven't read it thoroughly. It's a good resource to have in your uh, tool bag for your roles in school, in school leadership. <coughs> with that, I'll create a link with hopes that the rest of our group will read it. Faith, thank you for being with me and, and Carla, thank you for driving and listening. Any comments or questions? I apologize for all the movement and having to attend to him. I apologize. You're good. Children are our greatest resource. I'm glad we had a live example. He's alive, that's for sure. Thank you. See you Saturday. Thank you.